It's been 10 years, nine, nine years uh, ago. Their kids, all three of their kids were in a, a car wreck up in Divide, very serious car wreck. And the Lord worked a lot of miracles in that, and all three kids are alive. Ethan, give us a shout out, Ethan. Ethan is here with us today by the grace and, and protection of our Lord. He was just a little guy. He was 10, or no, he was nine then. Um, the part of the story that we haven't heard is that there has been struggle to get things settled financially. Um, it has been a, a, an arduous journey and, and a discouraging journey at times. But um, as you have testified to God's faithfulness, I believe you want to bring testimony to his faithfulness again today. Would you share with us an update? Yeah, there was just a couple of praises that I want to share with you. And I, do, I have notes because there's too many dates in here. I can't remember them all. Uh, the first praise we have is that Ethan is 19. He just got his driving permit to drive. And that's a big step for him to gain confidence and to move forward. To, to be independent and his his next goal after that is get his driver's license and to uh, get a job but Ethan has to have special devices put on his car because he can't use his right foot or his right leg uh, but we just wanted to praise God for that and uh, today and our second praise is that a lot that we haven't spoke about is that uh, most like pastor said most of you know about the car accident but we've also been dealing with legal stuff since the car accident. Um, I, had re I had bought insurance Jan the first part of January in 2002, and 2000, the end of January 2002 was when the uh, accident was. Well, while the kids were still in the hospital, the insurance company, they decided they wasn't going to cover the medical bills. So we filed a... Um, a civil claims in the federal court in 2004, January 2004, against that insurance company. The, ca the case actually sat inactive on a federal judge desk until uh, February 2007. No one knows why. Then in 2008, the case was thrown out by the federal judge and it never went to trial. Then it uh, then it, from from there from there it went to federal appeals court up in Denver. And they, they agreed with the federal judge in 2010. But from all that, what happened, I was responsible for the, their lawyer fees because we had, it's just the same as losing a case when you go to court. And that amounted to almost $36,000. And they garnished my wages at work. And then this past summer, I went through, with the help of Rob Hunt, I went through a bankruptcy court just me, not Emma, myself, and that, that stopped the garnishment, so I praise God for that. Uh, and now, in uh, 2010, the case went to state court, and, of course, the state court didn't look at it until our lawyers found a law that says that they, they have to give you a hearing. So we had a hearing this past summer, 2011, up in Denver, and my wife, Emma, she had to testify before the judge up there. So we've been waiting and waiting since this summer to hear from what happened to that hearing. And the lawyer just called me a couple of weeks ago, and, and he said that um, the judge ruled in our favor. So and what, what that means is that it's going to go to trial for the first time, and that's what we've been praying for just to uh, have it go to trial. When, when the, I was driving, when the lawyer called me after, I just spoke for him just for like 30 seconds, and I had to pull over and, and cry. And so then I called Emma at the school, and I told him at the office, I said, tell him I got good news. She needs to call me. So, but we just, our, our hope is in, is in the Lord, and we just uh, ask for your prayers in the coming months that uh, God will give us the strength to get through whatever lies ahead. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, your hand has been on this from the very beginning. We know that. We can testify to that because the kids are alive and they're well. And 
And we see the fruit of that in Ethan's life even this morning. We know, Lord, that um, you have the financial situation in hand as well. And we're asking that you go before the judge, that you go before the attorneys, and that you make a way for your answer to come through. You are our provider. You, it's clear that you're our protector, and you are our provider. We thank you for Howard and Emma. We thank you for their testimony. We thank you for their faithfulness to you. We thank you for their faith in you. And we thank you for the fruit of that that is yet to come. And it's in Christ's name we all pray and believe. And everybody said, Amen. what a story. Um, we have a special guest with us today. Some of you are going to know him and some of you uh, don't. He is our district superintendent, David Ralph. You may say, well, what's a district superintendent? What in the world is that? I'm not sure he knows. Uh, now, let me explain. It's, it's just a little bit of our governmental structure. We... This church here is not an island unto itself, but we are a part of the organization of the Church of the Nazarene, and we're all over the world. And um, to help us organize that, we are actually part of a district. The whole state of Colorado, all the Nazarene churches in the state are in the same district, and we have um, David Ralph as our leader. And he uh, gets around the state as much as he can to visit the local churches so, and share his heart about what the Lord is doing on the bigger level outside of our fellowship. And just so you know, he's meeting with our church board today to, uh, to do my two-year review. So every two years, the board um, looks over my work and, and the fruit of my work and decides if, if I should continue here or not. So we want to pray for that. <laughs> I think I'm in good standing, but you never know. Uh, so, uh, Pastor David, if you would come and share with us this morning what the Lord has put on your heart, let's, let's welcome him. Thank you, Pastor. Great to be with you all today. Uh, I think your pastor is correct when I'm not sure what a district superintendent is. Somebody best described it as a cemetery supervisor. There's a whole lot of people under me, but nobody's listening. Somebody asked me, what's your region? region?" And I said, well, it's the whole state, nothing but the state, so help me God. And I need all the help from God I can get. Let me give you just a few thoughts of what's going on in our regional mission area. That happens to be Colorado. Um, Seeing some good bright spots, some new uh, things happening across the state. Uh, In Falcon, we started a church there about 18 months ago. They are averaging now 200. Just last month, they averaged over 200. Isn't that exciting? Uh, And uh, we thank the Lord for that. We did another one, tried to start another one in Parker, and it's doing okay, but uh, we have to keep doing new works because that reaches people in affinity group areas, uh, demographic areas. I keep telling our churches, entry points, entry points, entry points. And by that, I mean find something new not, you don't have to sweep all of the programming away. Find something new to reach new people by perhaps affinity groups, motorcycle ministries, uh, basket weaving, cowboy churches. That was where I was headed with this. We're trying to start some cowboy churches. And uh, we've got three of those started, one on either side of Pueblo, about 10 miles east of Pueblo, one about 10 miles west of Pueblo and one over on the western slope. So this year, instead of people saying amen, I want everybody to say Yeehaw. Okay, no more amens this year. Can we try it? Yeehaw. Yeehaw. All right. So that will help you out a little bit. Uh, You were timid saying amen anyway. Yeehaw will help you. We'll probably give a report on that at our upcoming. We've changed the name a little bit of our district assembly to district conference. This next year we'll be having our district conference in Colorado Springs. And we'll be starting on a Thursday night. A Friday and we will be done by Saturday at noon my hope and my goal is every church will see this conference now which is general sessions and legislate we have a few legislative sessions not as much as before and workshops this year we're calling it a viral reformation now we all know what happens when something goes viral right uh, some of you said you were going viral with your virus today not I don't want that But when something on YouTube goes viral, 
it explodes, right? It just is explosive in the technological world. And we all know what a Reformation is. 1519, Martin Luther. And what happened in 1519 was when the church realized it was not all left to cleric George, but that there was the individual priesthood of believers. And so what we're trying to accomplish this year are marry those two today together, viral and reformation. And so the whole emphasis is going to be on lay ministries, equipping the saints, uh, intercessive ministries. Uh, so many times I'll sit across the table from a pastor struggling with a difficult situation, and I ask them, who is your intercessor? And most of them don't have intercessors, and there are about five principles for an intercessor. We're going to do intercessory ministries. We're going to do uh, equipping the saints, recruiting, uh, training, a lot of other things for that whole time. Now, I didn't tell you the big thing. On Friday night, we're going to have Lee Strobel. Anybody know who Lee Strobel is? Some of you do. The rest of you, I hope you will find out. He's written A Case for Christ, A Case for Easter, A Case, I believe, for Resurrection. I can't remember. Several books. And, uh, but we're going to try to get our churches to pass out A Case for Easter at Easter. And then we'll have 70 days of blogging and uh, information up to a great reformation. And listen, if 80 churches... Uh, had a rever reformation. That's the churches across Colorado that for which we're responsible. I believe the Lord could help us as we attempt to teach people and lead people to Jesus Christ. And so pray for that so that together we can unite uh, for those purposes. Ye ha! Oh, thank you. All right. I think you're all going to almost get it. Uh have you ever faced a situation of impossibility that there just seems to be no solution to? Uh, there just seems to be no answer to it. And you agonize over it, and you're heavy-hearted, and you're frustrated, and you're defeated, and you've just about given up. Uh, <clears throat> you're a little bit like Charlie Brown when he was writing his uh, his novel, and Lucy came up to him, and it, he wrote it out. It was a dark and stormy night. And Lucy comes up and says, well, I'm writing, what are you writing? A novel. Oh, you, don't you know novels begin with once upon a time? So he threw the piece of paper away, wrote, pulled out another blank piece of paper and wrote, once upon a time, it was a dark and stormy night. And don't you know people like that? It's like somebody licked all the red off their candy I mean, they're just defeated and discouraged, and it's an impossible situation, and you think there are no solutions. Let me just tell you, in that little vignette of life, I think we get a portrait of God. I think God wants to give us a portrait of himself through life's impossibilities. He has to show himself and make himself real in those situations to us, and sometimes I think it's, it, it's not only, but I think it's often that we only get a portrait of God through the ring of those impossible situations. Um, and I want to tell you a brief story, and then we're going to turn to, excuse me. Uh, I want to tell you a brief story, and then we're going to turn to Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter. And... Uh, I don't know if I have time to read the whole passage. Uh, if you're so inclined, before you take your afternoon nap this afternoon, uh, see if you can get a copy of this tape. It'll put you to sleep, this sermon. Bad joke. Uh, the story is about a man who uh, and his friend were walking into an art gallery. And they walked up to the art gallery, and they saw several pieces on the walls uh, that were were renditions of great pieces of work, of art. And uh, one of them stopped at one of the paintings. And in the painting, on opposite sides of the chessboard, there were two men. One was glowering over the other. Uh, he was full of hubris. He knew the, he had the other one defeated, and the other one had his head hung in defeat. And the title of the piece of work in the art gallery was Checkmate. 